First up, thanks everyone for being here. Um, I, uh, I'm Sam from D&D Newbie Sessions. I'm here with Zach, a.k.a. Ducks, uh, Dukies. Hello! <laughs> and uh, Zach is, or Ducks I'll say, is going to be uh, doing a character building um, presentation here. Uh, if you, by default, your mics are going to be muted in Discord um, in this particular channel. So if you have questions, um, want to make a comment or anything like that, uh, please use the special events uh, text channel. Um, that's in the Discord sidebar above us. Um, I can post a note in there too to make sure it's clear to everyone. But uh, So that's the text channel up there. Um, and... Uh, yeah, there's a, if for some reason you're having trouble connecting or anything with Discord itself, um, or you can't see or hear or anything like that, uh, there is also the Twitch stream in uh, that you can check out that was posted in the upcoming events channel um, there. So you can check that. Otherwise, uh, if you have to drop out early and you miss part of it or something like that, you can check the VOD later on our YouTube channel. Um, but I think that's all the little housekeeping stuff. So, uh, Ducks, feel free to take it away. All right, thank you for the introduction once again, Sam. Uh, as he mentioned, my name is Zach, a.k.a. Ducks, a.k.a. Phi Delta Cuss on Reddit. Um, been playing and dungeon mastering D&D for a few years now, and uh, I find character creation to be one of the more daunting things for a lot of people because when uh, you have a lot of options, you can get a little analysis paralysis, as they say. So my goal here today is to hopefully uh, help build a bit of a stronger foundation for everyone to understand the process and hopefully uh, kickstart some ideas in your head for any of the numerous characters you will inevitably end up making. Uh, so this is Character Building 101, how to make your 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons character. So we're just going to go over a brief overview of the steps first and then I'm going to delve into them step by step on a more detailed basis. So first up is choosing your character's race and sub-race. This will give you things like ability score boosts, racial traits and abilities, uh, and different things that help your character stand out in the world. Next, you'll be choosing your class. This is your adventuring job. You'll, and this will give you things like uh, saving throws, skill proficiencies, as well as item proficiencies, and your uh, overall health pool. Then you'll need to create your stats. And there are a few different methods to do this. Uh, the most common ones are using stat array or dice roll. There is also point by, which I'll make sure to cover all three of those. Um, next is choosing your background and assigning your final skill proficiencies. Background gives your character a little more attachment to the world, gives them a few extra perks, a few little bit uh, of extra skills, some extra starting gear. Uh, overall, it is a very nice way to help flesh out a bit more of the story side of your character. Um, and then there are a few other steps here. Make sure you grab your features gear. Uh, there's a skill overlap, which we'll get into uh, when we we'll get there. And then last but not least is picking your starting equipment. Be that a bow and a set of light leather armor or a great sword and a set of plate mail. Uh, anything that'll help your character survive their initial adventuring gear or adventuring options. Um, and general rule of thumb is you want to use lighter armor and weapons for ca characters with high dexterity and heavier armor weapons for characters with higher strength. So, where do we begin? I like to approach characters from two different aspects. There's the crunch and the fluff to a character. Crunch is all the mechanical portions of your character and will be the primary focus of this presentation. Um, these include things like your ability scores and their associated modifiers, your character's race, class, their different skill and save proficiencies, and everything that is easily quantifiable and viewable on a character sheet. Stuff that you can just pull your sheet up or look at your physical sheet and be like, ah, yes, this is the thing my character can do. Uh, the fluff is a little more about the story behind the character. You know, what do those ability scores uh, say about that kind of person? Where does your race and class fit in the world? What are the stories behind why your character is proficient at those particular skills? Um, but again, that's a bit more an advanced thing that I actually cover in a separate presentation, uh, which I will work with Sam to figure out later. So to start with, we're going to cover your six ability scores. These are the building blocks, the foundations of your character. 
You have strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma, commonly abbreviated as what I'm highlighting here on the screen. They hit a hint at a character's general potential in a certain area. So your ability score ranges from 0 to 20, with 20 being the natural limit for 99% of players. There are a few, very few character abilities and legendary magic items that let you surpass that limit, but they are excruciatingly rare, so I would not count on finding them. Um, a score of 10 is considered your average. Every you know baseline person, if you will, would have a score of 10, and that gives you a 0 modifier. And the modifier is the most important number to remember because that's what is actually going to affect your dice rolls. Every even number above 10 gives you plus 1. So a 12 is plus 1, a 14 is plus 2, 16 is plus 3, so on and so forth. And every odd number below 10 is a minus 1. So something like a 7 is a negative 2. If you have all the way to a 3, uh, that is negative 4. It's not great. Uh, your modifier for a particular set is going to influence um, all the saves and skills that are based off of that stat. Um, and for uh, certain attacks and spells, that will also affect how strong and effective those attacks and spells are. So the best way to uh, imagine these stats is with a tomato. Strength is your ability to crush a tomato. Dexterity is your ability to accurately throw a tomato or dodge one thrown at you. Constitution is the ability to eat a rotten tomato. Intelligence is knowing that tomato is a fruit. Wisdom would be having the street smarts to know it doesn't go in a fruit salad, regardless. And charisma would be being able to sell a fruit salad, even if it had tomatoes in it. Um, and they all have some nice secondary effects as well, uh, including affecting your jump height, your armor class, uh, how much health you have, Etc. Et which you can see on screen here, these are some of the additional uh, areas that your stats will be affected by. So the last, the uh, one of the last major stats covers something called your proficiency bonus. This number slowly increases at your character levels and represents their general aptitude towards things they are specialized in. It begins at a plus two and ends at a plus six, and it gets added to any skill or save you have proficiency with. It's also added to your attacks if you're using weapons you're proficient with, and spell attacks if they are appropriate to your magic casting stat. Um, you can also utilize this if you happen to have any tool proficiencies, and your DM decides that whatever check you're trying to make would allow that. There's also a trait called Expertise, which allows you to double your proficiency bonus when you're talking about a certain set of skills. And expertise is a little difficult to get, but is so incredibly useful when you have it. Uh, the one exception to this, which is a little strange, is your armor proficiency. And basically, if you try to use armor you're not proficient in, you get hit with a large number of penalties. Um, you'll be rolling uh, with distinct disadvantage. Uh, you can't cast spells. Your movement's hindered. There's a lot of really bad things that happen. So... Word of advice, don't use armor if you're not proficient with it. I'm looking at you, wizards. No armor. Bad. <laughs> um, and one last thing I want to cover here is using D&D Beyond. Uh, this is a very powerful online tool that lets you build characters. Uh, I'm actually towards the end of the presentation. I'm going to go through building a character with you all so you can see exactly how it works step by step. Uh, but the nice thing is it's mostly automated, so it will ensure that your character is as accurate as it could be. Um, the only tricky part could be determining HP when you level up, which is, again, something we'll cover when we get there. Um, you can download the Beyond 20 browser extension from your particular extension shop, be it Chrome, Firefox. Uh, I believe your Microsoft Edge supports it at this point. Um, but you can use that to roll into your virtual tabletop of choice, be it Astral, Roll20, things like that. Uh, but D&D Beyond General is just a very powerful tool, and I would strongly, strong, strongly recommend utilizing it and getting this Beyond 20 extension to make things work for you. So, we begin with step one, choosing your character's race. This is your character's main identity. Are they a human? Are they an elf? Are they a dwarf? Uh, are they something more exotic like a dragonborn or a tiefling? 
Uh, character's race gives them a number of benefits, including ability score increases and certain racial abilities. Uh, it can also affect their movement speed, how quickly they age, what kind of general alignments they lean toward, and what languages they speak. So if we look down here, the base human, as versatile as we are in real life, we get a plus one to every single score. So that's seven points total, which is a lot more than every other race. Uh, we age as we do here on Earth. We speak common, the fantasy version of English, or whatever your native language is, and one additional language. If we then go down to the elves, we can see that their lithe form gives an additional two dexterity. They reach adulthood at around 100 and live till around 750 years old, which can also affect their view on life. They have a lot of time compared to most other races. Uh, they get common plus elvish, their native tongue. They also have dark vision, which is like grayscale night vision. The ability to trance, which means they only need to rest for four hours a day as opposed to eight for everyone else. Uh, keen eyes, which gives them proficiency in the perception skill. And fey ancestry, which helps them resist charm and sleep-based magics. And then if we look at the traditional fantasy counterpart, dwarves. They get an additional two constitution because they are healthy, stocky, and they really, really love their ale. They live till around 350 years. Uh, they do, because of their small stature, have a slightly reduced speed in combat. They get common dwarvish. Uh, they also get some extra tool and weapon proficiencies, as well as the abilities of dark vision, stone cunning, which helps them identify stonework, because in traditional fantasy they are associated with masonry of all kind, and dwarven resilience, uh, which helps them resist poison effects a little bit better. Again, they really like their ale, and they probably work around a lot of toxic fumes in like smelts, smelting facilities. So there are different ways you could flavor that if you want to. Uh, secondary to this is something called a subrace. Uh, these are uh, further customizations from a general race. Taking the elf, for example, uh, your three most common subraces are going to be your high elf, your wood elf, and your drow, aka the dark elf. So high elves are traditionally a little bit haughtier, more magic, a little holier than thou. Um, but they're also very, very involved in studying the arcane. So they get an additional point of intelligence, an extra cantrip, which is a very weak spell, um, and a few extra weapon proficiencies because tradition. Uh, wood elves are a little more uh, foresty. Uh, they typically have darker hair, a more olive or uh, darker skin tone compared to high elves. Uh, they get an additional point of wisdom. They get an additional uh, five feet of movement. And they get the ability to hide a little bit easier when they are surrounded by nature. Again, kind of playing into their uh, traditional role as being more uh, explorers and hermits, if you will. And then we have the Dark Elf or the Drow. They are typically residents of the Underdark, a subterranean region of whatever world you're playing in. Um, they traditionally have darker, ashy, ebony skin. Excuse me. Ivory or pale colored hair. Uh, stand out, uh, but because of that, they get an extra point of charisma. Uh, they get an extended version of dark vision, um, and they also have a sensitivity to sunlight because, you know, they live underground, as one does. So if we then were to take a high elf, for example, as our entire uh, racial selection, we get the dexterity from the elf, the intelligence from the high elf, we get the cantrip from the high elf, dark vision and perception from the elf, weapon proficiencies, etc., etc. So every race has their base abilities, and then sub races usually give you a few different perks that will further differentiate you from other members of your race. Next up, we get to our class. This is your adventuring job. It gives you all your signature abilities, like the Barbarian's Rage, the Rogue's Sneak Attack, or a Fighter's Action Surge. There are 13 classes in total, uh, 14 if you include the Blood Hunter homebrew by Matt Mercer, which is more or less approved by Wizards of the Coast as it's on D&D Beyond. Um, but each of them has a wildly different skill set, um, and they also determine what ability scores you should focus on to be your highest. Uh, how much HP you get overall, uh, what kind of weapons you can use, uh, what kind of skills and saving throws you have, uh, as well as whatever gear you start with. Um, and while it's not very important upon initial character creation, 
it is important to consider what subclass, uh, which is kind of your more specialized tree, if you will, of your class, you want to play as you build and flavor your character, because subclasses will play wildly different from each other. So it's important to consider, you know, maybe your paladin that is very lawful good and sticks to the rules might not take intimidation as uh, one of their proficiencies, whereas a Oath of Vengeance, who's all about hunting down people who have wronged him, would definitely lean into intimidating someone into telling them information. So, brief overview of the classes. We have the, first up, the Artificer, is a magical tinkerer who uses their creations to fight for and alongside them. You will primarily focus on Intelligence as your casting stat, and Strength and or Dexterity as a backup stat, if you will. Barbarians are your big, burly melee bruisers. You want to focus on Strength and Constitution because you are wielding a big weapon and you are a big target. Uh, bards are your performance-based uh, casters. Their magic mostly is supportive abilities, and you'll want good charisma and strength or dexterity. Clerics are heralds of divine power. Um, they say, uh, hey, my Jesus is great. Let us go forth and spread his uh, divine will. You want to focus on wisdom and strength and constitution because you're typically going to be wearing heavier armor, and if you're not hitting something with a spell, you're hitting something with a mace. Druids are conduits of nature's might. They often uh, include shape-changing abilities. Uh, they're kind of like clerics, but if they were tree huggers instead. <laughs> uh, their primary abilities are going to be wisdom and strength and or dexterity as well. Fighters are your adaptable combatants. If you want something dead quickly, you send a fighter after it. And you're going to want to focus on strength or dexterity, depending on what kind of weapon and armor you want to use and constitution, because you are more than likely going to be in the front lines taking a lot of damage. Monks are your agile skirmishers. They like to go from target to target, punching them one or two times, and then getting out of there. So you'll want to focus on dexterity and wisdom as your two stats. Paladins are holy warriors bound by a sacred oath to themselves. You'll want to focus on strength or dexterity, again, based on your weapons and armor, as well as charisma for some of your spellcasting ability. Then we have the ranger, the wilderness expert. Think of Bear Grylls if he had magic. Uh, you want to focus on, again, strength or dexterity, depending on your weapon and armor, and wisdom for your spell casting. Rogues are the masters of stealth, subterfuge, and utility. They are what uh, people like to refer to as a skill monkey, and every party should have one, even if they like to steal everything in sight. You'll want to focus on dexterity and intelligence or wisdom for a rogue. Sorcerers are uh, the magic jocks of the world. They are born with magic and can use really powerful spell-altering abilities to modify their spells in ways wizards could study for years and years and never be able to do. You'll want to focus on charisma as your spellcasting, and then dexterity or constitution. Warlocks are uh, an interesting class. They obtain their magic through a pact. So they basically sold their soul to a demon, Cthulhu, or any other number of deities to get their magic ability. And you'll focus on charisma for your casting stat, and then strength or dexterity as a secondary. And then last but not least is our wizard, the book nerd that you don't want to insult because they will fireball you into oblivion. You want to focus on intelligence for their casting, and dexterity as a good secondary stat. So... Taking our previous example of uh, the wizard, if we look at it, your primary score is intelligence, since that's the stat their spellcasting is based off of. And since wizards are mostly all about spells, you'll want to make sure your intelligence is as high as it could be. For their health, they get a 1d6, uh, plus their constitution modifier per level, including the max amount for level 1. They are one of two classes that get the d6. They are very squishy, so wizards... If you're fighting with a sword, something's gone wrong. Uh, for weapon proficiencies, they only get daggers, darts, and a few other very basic weapons. Again, highlighting their role as mostly a caster. If, if your wizard's using a weapon, something's gone south. Uh, they get a selection of skills from Arcana, History, and a few others. Again, mostly focusing on Intelligence as their base stat here. Again, reflecting their Arcane training. For their saving throws, they get a bonus to their intelligence and wisdom saves, which again is reflective of how powerful their mind's supposed to be. 
Uh, and then for starter gain, they get a quarter staff or a dagger, component pouch or arcane focus, a few packs, and a spell book. Because every wizard needs a spell book and a walking stick. You know, Gandalf doesn't run around with a, 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 a giant sword or anything. He has a staff. So here we get to probably one of the more fun parts of character creation is creating your stats. Uh, there are a few different ways to do it. But the three most popular are stat array, dice roll, and point buy. Uh, first, you get a static set of numbers, as you can see on screen here. They range from 15 to 8, and you'll place them in whatever stat you want. Uh, for the dice roll, uh, the most traditional way is to roll 4d6, drop the lowest one of those four, and add the, the three together. Do this six or seven times, and you'll get a set of numbers, and then you plug those into whichever stat you want for your initial bit. And then point by, uh, every stat begins at 8, and you have a certain amount of points to spend to increase those stats up to a certain point, and you want to try to be as efficient with those uh, purchases as possible. Once uh, all of your initial numbers are set in place, you'll add your racial bonuses to those numbers, and that will give you the final result that you'll actually then write down or plug into your character sheet for your level 1 character stats. Uh, next step is selecting your background and finalizing your skills. So your character's background provides some mechanical and story-based perks to help flesh your character out a little bit. They'll give you some skill proficiencies, a little bit of extra gear, um, and some type of feature that you can work with your DM to figure out how best to leverage that with the world around you. Um, this is also where you'll finalize your character's skill proficiencies. And what I was mentioning earlier, was that your background and your race uh, may or may not give you certain skills, which will be included in the list of skills you can pick from in your class. Now, obviously, since you already have those skills, you can technically take those off the list, and that will help narrow down your choices to, you know, making sure that you don't essentially waste a choice by picking a skill you already have. So, for example, if your background gave you perception as a proficiency, you wouldn't want to also take that as a class skill if you only get to choose two. Because uh, then that's essentially half of your pick gone to waste because you're doubling up when it doesn't do anything. Um, because in order to have expertise double your proficiency, you have to have a certain excuse me, trait or ability that actually directly gives it to you. You can't double up and then have it have proficiency become expertise. You have to have something that grants you that specifically. So important to to remember when you're finalizing everything. So if we look at an example background here, we have the Acolyte. It is a follower of a particular religion. They spent most of their life devoted to a deity uh, and within their associated temples or traveling, spreading their good word. So as such, they get skill, uh, their skills are insight and religion. Insight because you're interacting with a lot of people, so you kind of learn how to read people. And religion because, well, you're an acolyte. You study religion, it's what you do. Uh, because of them normally traveling around or interacting with a lot of people, they will also get two additional languages. For their starting gear, they get a holy symbol associated with their deity. They get a prayer book or a wheel, vestments, incense, clothes, and a little bit of extra starting gold. And then this feature is where you can really flesh out your character and work with the DM to make your character more interesting. Shelter of the Faithful. Uh, you can perform religious rites associated with your deity, which can include everything from marriages to, you know, funeral rites, very basic prayers, meal blessings, things like that. Uh, maybe your particular deity is a god of combat, and so your character gets invited to you know, uh, oversee or help assist with a local gladiator tournament. That's a plot hook right there. You can work with your DM to figure out, hey, this is a way I can make my character more interesting. Uh, then you also gain a few other bonuses while you're uh, around or in your deities associated temples. And last but not least, selecting your starting gear. Uh, every class gives you a different set of options to pick, be it the fighter being able to pick a ton of weapons and armor, uh, the wizard having a more minimal selection and mostly picking how they want to flavor their spells. Uh, and every equipment pack will vary from class to class. Uh, so just keep in mind when you're looking at uh, your class, uh, 
Uh, think about what makes sense for your for your character. You know, is your fighter more of a dungeon diver or are they like a city watch? Uh, you can kind of use the pack's name to guess what is in there. Or if you want, you can always, uh, there are plenty of resources online to look up what specifically is included in each pack. And you can get creative with what you can use that for. Uh, it's important to remember if you see two options listed for a particular choice, you get one or the other, not both. Uh, same rules apply for the actual equipment packs at the end. Most classes give you an option between two, like an Explorer's Pack, Dungeoneer's Pack, Priest Pack, things like that. Uh, and you'll also make sure you need to include any extra items given from your background. And over here, you can see you got CP, SP, EP, Gold, etc. This is where you will note all, note all of your coinage. Uh, the general conversion rate is 10 of 1 is equal to 1 of the higher. Uh, the sole exception being Electrum, which I've not seen used a whole lot. I believe it has a conversion rate of 5 to 1 for silver, so it kind of breaks it a little bit. But in general, 10 copper is 1 silver, 10 silver is 1 gold, 10 gold is 1 platinum. So you can think of multiples of 10 as your character gets more and more money. So, here's what it looks like on a traditional character sheet, 5th edition. Uh, for Magic McCaster, our High Elf Wizard with the Sage background. So if we take the stat array, um, we know we get scores of 15, 14, 13, 12, 10, and 8. Uh, looking at our High Elf, we know we get an additional plus 2 to dexterity, 1 to intelligence. So since I know intelligence is one I want to have my highest score as, I'll put that 15 into intelligence, and after the bonus, it'll go up to a 16, which is the next even number, so it'll increase my intelligence from a plus 2 to a plus 3. And then because the dexterity is a plus 2, I can feel pretty confident putting it in any of these even stats and having it just be a solid 1 bump. So you can see here, I put the 12 in there to take it from a plus 1 to a plus 2 as it gets increased by 2. And the other stats remain unchanged because they actually did not get any bonuses. And now that these scores are set, we can determine the skill proficiencies. And again, taking everything into account, you can see Sage gives me Arcana and History. So I've notated that here, Arcana, History. Being an Elf gives me Perception. So again, noted it there. The Wizard gets allows me to pick two from this particular list. And you, as I mentioned earlier, Arcana and History are already taken, so we can effectively strike them out from the list. And out of those, I decided maybe my character, you know, as much as he's a sage, maybe he's kind of decent at reading people and also has a weird, you know, herbology pastime. So I gave him Insight and Medicine, which you can see here. Well, Insight I forgot to, to check, but Medicine is also elected here. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, your proficiency bonus is added to anything you are proficient with. So you can see Arcana here is based off of Intelligence. So I have Intelligence modifier of plus 3, Proficiency of plus 2, add them together for plus 5. Same thing for Arcana, the Intelligence-based, Investigation being Intelligence-based, Wisdom, I have a plus 2 to that. So additional 2 brings up to 4. Um, and same thing up here for our saving throws. Again, these are based off of the stats. So intelligence and wisdom is a three and two. Add two to each of these, and you get five and four. So it's just important to remember that your proficiency bonus gets added to the base number of anything you're proficient with. A few other stats to cover are AC, initiative, and speed. AC, or armor class, is how hard it is to hit your character. Uh, armor is typically divided into three different classes, light, medium, and heavy. Um, traditionally, more of your uh, fightery or melee combat-based roles, like a fighter, paladin, ranger, characters that are going to get up in people's faces, usually get the heavier armor, whereas characters like the wizard and the sorcerer, um, who wouldn't really have a reason to wear armor, don't get any armor proficiency whatsoever. Um, it's important to remember that light armor allows you to add your entire dexterity modifier to your armor class. Medium armor allows you to add up to a plus two bonus. Heavy armor offers no dexterity bonus. The trade-off is that medium and heavy armor, their base armor class number is higher than the lighter armor. So again, based on what your character, what their stats are, if you have a really strong character that has low dexterity, 
might be beneficial to throw on a piece of heavier armor or medium armor. Whereas if they are like maxed out like 18 or 20 dexterity to give you a plus four, plus five respectively, you can go with a lighter armor that won't give you disadvantage on stealth as most heavy armors do. And that will allow you to keep a higher armor class while being able to be stealthy as well. Speaking of dexterity, we have initiative. This is the number added to your d20 roll when you first start combat to determine the order of your turns in combat. Generally, the higher it is, the better it is. And by default, it is tied to your character's dexterity score. Um, and speed is how fast your character is in combat. On most combat maps that use a grid or a hex system, uh, one square or one hex is equivalent to five feet, and you can move up to your total speed during your turn. So most races and classes by default have 30 feet of movement speed, so that's six squares. But as I mentioned previously, if you're playing something like a wood elf, for example, you get an additional five feet of movement, so now you can move um, seven squares per turn instead of six. And some classes, like the Monk and the Barbarian, also get features later on that allow them to move faster than normal. So, I mentioned a lot of crunch so far. All your characters' stats, how they interact with each other, things like that. Um, and I'm sure those of you who have, uh, uh, who have already you know, been thinking about this can probably start to see that some races and sub-races have their own bonuses, which would benefit a class especially well. As I just did in my previous example, the High Elf Wizard gets a boost to intelligence, a boost to dexterity. They're two, the two most important stats for a wizard. Um, and they get an extra cantrip, which expands their spell selection. Uh, if we look at something like a half-orc, for example, uh, they get a boost to their strength and constitution, as well as an ability to resist death once a day, and the ability to deal some extra damage, which really benefits a barbarian. These characters make a lot of sense from, you know, a crunch standpoint. They're uh, what you could call building a quote-unquote optimal character. But if, what if you want to play something different? That is perfectly fine. Uh, there is no uh, limit or restriction on what characters can play what classes. Um, sole exception being a blade singer wizard, but even then, that is traditionally ignored uh, by people. Uh, so, while having a dwarvish rogue or a heavily armored elven fighter, might not be quote unquote optimal and have you know a good crunch to be like ah yes i am beating the game they will be no less fun and there'll be plenty of fluff to the table as well as i said the only true limit to character creation should be your imagination and i guess a little bit of rational thought um but as, as i mentioned there's no real proper restriction you know elves can be anything they want humans can be anything they want there are no class race restrictions uh, for 99.99% of, of cases. Again, the, the only two exceptions now I think about the other one, uh, there's a barbarian subclass called the Battle Ranger, which is traditionally a dwarven only thing, and the wizard subclass, the Blade Singer, which is traditionally a elven only thing. Um, but again, that is up to your DM if they want to put any restrictions on anything like that. But most DMs I know don't do such a thing. Now, I can't talk about character creation without mentioning uh, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, uh, just one of the most recent uh, released books by Wizards of the Coast, and it kind of threw most of what I just said out the window, but it's up to the DM whether they want to use these rules or not. So, with Tasha's character origin rules, uh, your racial ability score boost can technically be applied to any score now, but they can't stack together. So as I previously mentioned with our High Elf, now instead of getting two Dexterity, one Intelligence, maybe you do want to build a High Elf fighter that's a charismatic leader that wields a big sword. With Tasha's rules, you can put that plus two into Strength or Constitution, uh, plus one into Charisma to make him you know, a little bigger, bulkier, a little more charismatic. Um, you can also swap starting languages, uh, certain proficiencies. You can even change your subclass if it makes sense. But again, this is all optional rules that your DM may or may not use. So I would suggest taking up with them when you start the game and ask, hey, 
are you using these modified rules or not? Uh, that way you can be fully aware before you go into anything about the actual process going forward. And as you can see here, there's a handy dandy little chart about what proficiencies you can swap should you feel like that is appropriate to your character. Tosh has also included a custom lineage rule. Uh, this will, again, is up to your DM's discretion, but if they allow it, you can make a variant for an existing race um, by replacing some of their baseline features. Uh, you still have to be a small or medium-sized humanoid, base walking speed of 30 feet, uh, you get one ability score increase of your choice, and one feat, which is an optional perk uh, that helps customize your character a little bit further. And that's a whole nother discussion for another time. But suffice to say, there are a lot of really cool and flavorful abilities uh, that you could take as a feat, which can really, you know, help build the exact character you want to play as. The idea that you have in your head, you can help that come to, to fruition. But again, this is an optional rule. Um, so if you, have, if you want to mess around with this, check with your dungeon master before you bring this type of character uh, to the session, just to make sure they're okay with it. Um, so, I, as I mentioned before, uh, most of this has been the crunch side of the character. You know, the, the mechanical quantifiable bits that, how does this character work? But they are only part of a character. Uh, I've, as I've mentioned briefly in a few examples here, um, if you are so inclined delving into the mind and rationale and history of a character, can also be incredibly rewarding. And I'm just going to briefly touch on this because I, <clears throat> excuse me again, feel like it's worth mentioning to some people, is that every race, class, and background has a few built-in narrative hooks to latch on to. Uh, while they are far too vast to cover in detail in this session, uh, there are some general uh, trains of thought that can apply to all of them. Uh, what is the reason for your character leaving their old life behind? Um, what could drive them, you know, from whatever existence they had beforehand, be it, you know, was your paladin inspired by an event they saw, or have they always been this way? Uh, has your wizard always been a curious study? Did they receive, you know, a letter of recommendation, a book from a family member? There are a lot of different uh, things to consider about your character's race, where they fit in the world, their class, and how that interacts with everyone around the world and their background, and how that ties into everything else going on with them. So it's just something cool to consider, um, even as you're trying to familiarize with yourself with the mechanics. I always find it fun to try to logic out in your head, okay, my character's like this, so what makes sense for them? Uh, and bringing that kind of all together, um, before I go into the practical example here, is a story of my first level 20 character, James Riete. He started off as a College of Lore bard. Um, from a purely mechanical crunch standpoint, the party I was with didn't have any uh, support casters. I was the only uh, kind of support-ish role. And Lore bards have an ability where they can take spells from other class lists and apply them to their own. So I decided, okay, our party needs some healing, I'm going to pick up some cleric spells. And my DM was like, okay, uh, explain to me in character how you know these cleric spells. I was like, uh, I, I've never been one to play up the whole, like, bard seduce everyone. So I was like, okay, maybe, like, he did that once, actually fell in love, and hasn't bothered with anything since then. So I said, oh, there was, like, a, uh, you know, someone at a, uh, a dual study magic academy that, you know, I met, fell in love with over summer. We had a big summer thing, and then she had to go off back to, you know, wherever she had to go to. And he was like, okay, that works. Little did I know, he would bring her back, reintroduce her into the story, and long story short, she ended up uh, dying. However, uh, what happened behind the scenes was clerics have an ability called Divine Intervention, and he, the DM rolled that for her as her dying breath and actually had it activate. So he decided she was going to be raised into a mid-level archfey, uh, which gave the game a whole lot of fluff because now I have, you know, I'm personally vested in seeing the stability of the archfey order, 
there was some drama in the real world for, you know, me figuring out who had killed her. A whole lot of really good moments came out of that. But then that influenced a little bit of crunch later because I decided um, that uh, my character was still so smitten with her that he was going to try to see if he could um, get some of her power in the form of multi-class into Warlock, which ended up happening. So my character, who I originally planned to go pure bard with, ended with uh, two levels of Warlock as a as a taking a bit of a fey patron approach. Um, and that all just occurred out of a, a single choice I made at the beginning of the campaign. So that's just kind of a... I feel like that's a really good example of how... You know, these symbols can have these far-reaching consequences. So don't be afraid to, you know, full send, as they say, into whatever choices you want to make. Um, you know, be bold. And, uh, yeah, don't be afraid to, to build your character how you want and stick with your guns. So with that out of the way, we're going to go to the more practical example here. Now, let me make sure that my screen is still being shared properly. There we go. All right, so this is D&D Beyond, the website I was mentioning a little bit earlier. Um, this is a fantastic website that allows you to make a bunch of characters, which can be a problem if you uh, have a character making problem like I do. Um, I actually have a phone app that I've done most of my character creation on, but D&D Beyond is still excellent. So. We're going to walk through uh, building a character from start to finish, just so you all can see the process and figure out, you know, how how this works. So if you go to your collections here, uh, you'll see that we've got my one character, Vicarn. It's a dragonborn fighter that I always keep on standby. Um, but if you want to make a new character, we'll go up here to create a character. Uh, we're going to use the uh, standard approach to start with. So we'll do fancy name generator. Randomize. All right, Serenkine. Interesting. So, uh, first bit of stuff for making characters on D and D Beyond, which isn't as much of an issue if you're making them all on your own. Um, but under here, you can see allowing homebrew, critical role. Uh, again, this content will be up to your DM's discretion, and you can always come back and modify these toggles later. Uh, we have optional class features and customize your origin, as I mentioned a little bit earlier the uh, additional rules from Tasha. Uh, you have advancement type, milestone or XP. And again, all this can be changed later. Um, I'm going to do manual HP for now. Uh, that way I can kind of show you how that works because that can be a point of confusion uh, for a lot of people later. Um, I would definitely suggest keeping the feats and multi-class prerequisites on. Uh, show the scale level spells. And again, the rest of this is kind of up to your DM, whether they want to uh, keep track of things or not, like coin weight, encumbrance, things like that. Uh, so we're going to go with that. And here's where we get to pick our races. As you can see, there are a lot. And this is only a very, very small selection of them. Um, now, given my character's name, Sarian Klein, Sarian Klein, to me, that sounds very elvish. So we're going to go with that. Um... And you know what, we'll, we'll go Eladrin just because I think that's a lot of fun. So Eladrin uh, is a, another elf variant that is um, a little rarer. Uh, they, again, plus your dexterity, the Feyance history, all this. Uh, this is the version that originally appears in the Dungeon Master's Guide, so this is not the like official version. But for the purposes of this, I figure I'd show you guys how this works. Um, and then what makes Eladrin special is they get a uh, racial spell called Face Step, which lets them cast the Misty Step spell, which is a short-range teleport, uh, once per rest. Because the whole thing with the Lodron is they're a little more Fey Touch than most Elves, so they're even more magic-y than the High Elves. So we're going to go with that. So And then this, this page just lets us review the details about what all these uh, different traits give us, which is fantastic. So now, thinking about a class. So again, knowing that I get uh, dexterity from the Eladrin bit, um, I'm thinking maybe a monk could be fun. So we can click the monk. Again, you can see this tells us right here what they do. Here's your hit dice, so how much health you get. Your primary ability scores, dexterity and wisdom. 
and your saves. And then these cover all of the uh, abilities you will get as your character levels up. Uh, but for character creation, we're only going to focus on the first bits, which would be unarmored defense and martial arts. So we'll add class. Now, as you can see, we are starting at level one. So we get our hit points, proficiencies. So D&D Beyond does things a little differently here. Uh, we actually choose our class proficiencies before anything else. Uh, so we're going to go with acrobatics because in my head, I'm thinking this character is maybe, you know, a bit of a performer, a bit of a, a, a showman, if you will. So we can do that. And you know what? Uh, if they're going to be a bit of a, of a show person, maybe insight because they've had to, you know, negotiate terms of contracts for a while. And then we get a musical instrument or artisan's tools. Hmm. You know, elves really like their fine arts, so I'll say, you know, again, kind of lean into that performance bit. Um, uh, maybe they'll go with the lyre. Why not? So for sign level one. We've got our proficiencies chosen, and again, this is just reviewing everything we get at first level. And now we get to choose our ability scores. Again, we're going to go, we'll do standard array, that way you know what's going on. And you can see we have their different representations. You can see we've got plus one intelligence and plus two dexterity. So since I know dexterity is a very important stat, and I get a plus two, We'll go ahead and throw the 14 in there. So with the racial bonus, it'll pop it up to a 16 for a plus 3. And then I know Wisdom is another important stat. So I'll go ahead and put the 15 in there. Uh, and now knowing I get a plus 1 intelligence, if I wanted to, I could say my character is also incredibly smart, put the 13 in there, which would then bump it up to a 14, the next even number, and give it an additional bonus. Um, and I think we, we are going to, actually, we're going to go with uh, 12 intelligence. And then I'll put the 13 into charisma. And now I have a choice to make here, because one of these stats has to be what's called the quote-unquote dump stat. Uh, now we're going to say, because monks are typically a little bit more frontlining, uh, we'll put a 10 constitution, so I have distinctly average health, and an 8 strength. So I'll be very lithe and weak but I can uh, dodge things very, very well. So that can work out for me. Um, actually, now I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking maybe this person is not super great at negotiating. Mm, nah, you know, they, they're, they're performers, so we're going to keep the high charisma up there. We'll say they're not used to, to fighting a whole lot, so that's why their constitution is not super great. Actually, hmm... We're going to actually switch these around. This is, again, me thinking from a mechanics standpoint, monks are traditionally a bit more frontline-y, so probably actually want to have a little bit more constitution for a little bit more health. Um, and I'll just have to, you know, imagine my character is average intelligence. You know, maybe he gets caught up in the act a little, a little too much when uh, doing their performances and has the wisdom to recognize people are messing with them with contracts doesn't have the intelligence to know how to actually break them. There we go. And then description. So again, background, we do not have a lot because for D&D Beyond, you have to buy books uh, separately to get those. Um, but given what I've said so far, uh, we're just going to go with Folk Hero since, you know, well-loved person. Excuse me. So that gives us animal handling and survival as additional skills, as well as the ability to use land vehicles. And then a set of artisan's tools. Uh, and you know what? We will say since they've got a uh, liar as their uh, performance tool, uh, we'll say they probably have, we'll say tinker's tools. That way they can uh, do some very small repairs on their liar, as it were. And then here's our rustic hospitality feature. Um, I can find uh, hide rest recuperation among commoners. And they'll traditionally help me out, which, again, is something you can work with your DM on. And here we have some suggested characteristics, which we can choose or use to inspire our own. Uh, we've got details, physical description, personal characteristics, any other types of notes we'd like to add. 
And again, a lot of this can be go back and modified a little bit later, um, especially these kind of details and things that don't have a mechanical impact. So I'm not going to worry about those too much right now. And then starting equipment. Uh, unless your DM gives you magic items out the gate, you will not have to worry about any of that. So we have to choose either starting equipment or starting gold. Uh, now the way this works is if we choose equipment, we get to choose from a specific set of gear. Or if we choose starting gold, um, it will give us a certain amount of gold to buy. And again, you can work with your DM to say ahead of time, okay, this is the specific pieces of equipment I've bought. But for ease of use, we're going to go with starting equipment right there. So we can either pick a short sword or any simple weapon. I'm going to go with a simple weapon, and we're going to pick a quarterstaff, an iconic monk weapon. Um, and then we'll go with an explorer's pack, which, as you can see here, includes backpack, bedroll, and a variety of other items. Makes a little more sense for someone who's maybe traveling now with a uh, carnival or other type of performing organization. Uh, they're not diving in dungeons necessarily, but they are traveling around. And then I get my uh, darts here. We'll start with our Tinker's Tools equipment, since that was what we have proficiency in. And you can see here the Folk Hero is giving us shovel, iron pot, common clothes, and extra gold. So then we click the Add Starting Equipment, and it'll put that all in our inventory. And then we get to the final screen here. We can view characters starting a campaign, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We're just going to go to View Character Sheet. This is a warning that'll pop up if you have the Beyond 20 extension. It basically says, hey, we don't see a virtual tabletop. Don't worry about it right now. So here is the final D&D Beyond character sheet in all of its glory. You can see here we have the character name, uh, the Eladrin variant, Monk Level 1. We have all of our ability scores on the bottom up here with the modifiers up top. You can see we have these two dots representing our save proficiencies. Uh, this has a nice place for our passive uh, skills, which your DM may or may not utilize. Uh, monks don't wear armor, so I don't have any. Got tools, languages, weapons, and here is where all of our skills come into play. As you can see, we got survival and animal handling, even though we didn't pick those. We got those courtesy of our background. And again, wisdom plus two, proficiency plus two, add together to make four. We got initiative of plus three for our dexterity modifier being three. We've got an armor class of 15 because monks have a very cool way they uh, calculate their armor class while they're not wearing armor. We've got our traditional speed of 30. Uh, we've got our current hit points, which is the maximum amount on the dice plus our constitution modifier. And then uh, we've got a list of all of our attacks here, which is our unarmed strike. Uh, it's important to note that on D&D Beyond, uh, you actually have to click to uh, toggle your active abilities or your active equipment. So I have to click the Dart and Quarter Staff, and then that will add it to our weapon attack. And now, you can see you've got everything. And if you're seeing this little uh, highlight icon on screen, that means you are good to go to click it and make your uh, particular attacks in the virtual tabletop. So here would be where we have our spells. As you can see, I've got Misty Step uh, as part of my Face Step ability. Again, the list of all the equipment we have, our features and traits from our class and our race, any type of descriptors we want to have, any notes, and any extras. Um, but that about does it. That is uh, the, the long and short of putting your character together. Uh, again, going back to kind of the overview here. Um, in summary, you've got choosing your race, sub-race, marking those ability score boosts down so you remember them for later, choosing your class, creating your stats, choosing the background, assigning those skill proficiencies, making sure there's no overlap, choose your starting equipment, and once all of that is put together, your character is now ready to venture forth, uh, delve into some dungeons, slay some dragons, and acquire all of the loot in the world. I think that about does it for me. So if, if anyone has any questions, feel free to uh, shoot them in the special events text. Um, I'm more than happy to stick around and answer questions if any of y'all have them. 
Uh, Sam might be AFK for a minute, so sit here and enjoy Zoza's company. <laughs> I'm here, uh, Ducks. Okay. Welcome, welcome. Yep, so for anyone that's, uh, if you have questions along the way there, just like you said, uh, you can post them up in the special events text channel, which is above us in Discord. You can just type on in there. Uh, and if you're watching on Twitch, you can also ask in the Twitch uh, chat, and then I can uh, read those over. Mm -hmm. And as we're waiting, uh, these are some uh, slides that I have uh, conveniently stolen from uh, one Sam who helps run this thing. <laughs> um, this is kind of a, uh... huh. glad I could uh, help you, Galf, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, looks like a Celtic or a Gaelic name. I'm not sure if there's a difference or not, but awesome looking. Uh, so this is the traditional 5e character sheet versus the D&D Beyond character sheet. As you can see here, there's a lot of overlap as to where things are at. Uh, so here is where, again, all of your uh, scores and modifiers go. Um, you can actually put either one in uh, any space here. So like this, for example, has the modifiers up top with the scores on bottom. You could also do scores up top, modifiers on bottom, but I prefer the uh, scores up top because it's easier to see. So again, over here, we've got proficiency bonus in the circle, proficiency bonus over there. Inspiration is something your DM can hand out, which is something that you know more advanced players can get into when you get there. Uh, then again, we have our saving throws marked here, marked here. Got all your skills. Again, a very similar list. Uh, the player sheet one is nice because it has the little thing next to it that tells you which stat you're actually getting that bonus from, which is very, very nice because there some DMs may occasionally ask you to make checks uh, using a different skill. The most uh, common one I see is people asking for intimidation using your strength. So instead of your charisma bonus, you would actually add your strength bonus instead. Um, all right, what have we got here? Etiquette question from Ihar. How much of your characters are you expected to have prepared when joining a new game? Uh, that is mostly dependent on your DM, to be honest. Uh, some DMs say, hey, just have, you know, your character's mechanics figured out, and we'll go from there. Uh, some DMs like you to have, you know, a pretty good chunk of backstory prepared. Uh, most DMs sit somewhere in the middle, where they would, at the very least, like your character to, you know, be mechanically sound... Uh, have all your stats done correctly, um, you know, have nothing uh, odd or game-breaking, you know, to start the game. And then a little bit of backstory, maybe, you know, part of your character's motivation as to why they are adventuring. Um, and if your character, if you and the team can work together, you can even figure out, you know, what parts of your backstory can be incorporated into the world um, and then speaking from a DM's perspective, if you as a player were to give me a backstory about, oh, my character was involved with blah, 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 you know, I've got NPC X, Y, and Z at location A, B, and D. Um, if I hadn't specifically made those yet, that then gives me uh, inspiration to be like, oh, yes, this place definitely exists in the world now. Now I have something I can use to flesh it out a little bit more. Um, but in general, that's something you would need to confer with your DM to see how much of a backstory your they will want your character to have. Um, I would definitely say at the very least, um, for all of your mostly martial characters, things like barbarians, fighters, uh, monks, rogues, things that don't have a lot of magic going on, um, at the very least have like your character stats and... Uh, skills and equipment all sorted out ahead of time. Um, that way the DM can be fully prepared, you know, going into it. Uh, for anyone who's picking up spell casting, I would at the very least suggest you uh, pick out your spells ahead of time, familiarize yourself with what those spells do. <clears throat> Excuse me. That way when, you know, it comes to combat, your turn is not spending a minute or two looking up, oh, what does the spell do? And you can just be like, ah, oh, yes, I know exactly what this does. I'm going to cast this thing. So I find that especially useful. Uh, Sam, any feedback from you since you've been doing this uh, pretty much as long, if not longer than me? 
Uh, no, I think you, I think you got it there. That was good. Um, let's see. Yeah, if, I guess uh, I'm not seeing any other questions coming through. Again, if anyone on Twitch wants to ask one, do so now. Um, Speak now, forever hold your peace. <laughs> exactly. So to kind of continue our review of the, the thing over here while we wait for any more questions. Uh, we've got armor class initiative and speed all kind of clustered together here. Um, we've got current health and uh, temporary hit points here. Um, I guess actually this would be something I should touch on uh, since it's confused my party a little bit um, is how hit dice and how your health works. So if we go back to Serengi here, let's do this. Edit character. Let's go to manage. So the the way health works in in D and D is every class is assigned a certain hit dice. Uh, most classes have a D eight as their hit dice. Uh, the only variants are the sorcerer and the wizard have a D six. The fighter and the ranger get a D ten. And the Barbarian alone gets a D12. Um, and the way you determine your health is you roll that dice. Whatever number comes up, you add your Constitution modifier to it. Add it to your current total max health. And that gives you your new max health. The one exception is for first level, you always get the guaranteed maximum value. So, for example, if we look at a monk here, you can see the monk has the D8 hit dice. So for level one, we're going to assume my rolled HP is an eight. So I apply that and then go look at my character. And as you can see, well, let's let it update here. Why do you not want to update? All right. So rolled health is eight. There we go. I guess it just didn't save. So if we go back and look at our character now, no, it's still not one update. All right, then. I know not why it, uh, oh, you know what? I think I know what I have to do. I need to long rest. Confirm it. All right, then. Well, I'll worry about that later. Anyway. So, uh, working for more health. That's very strange. So, traditionally, um, for determining your health, what you'll do is for for your first level, you'll take the maximum value of your dice, which for a monk is D8, add your Constitution modifier, and that is your level one HP. Then, for leveling up, you have two different options, which again is going to be dependent on your DM. You can either take the average, uh, which is half of the dice value rounded up, add your constitution modifier to that number, add it to your previous health total, and that'll be your new health. Or you can roll for your uh, health bonus. And for that, you'll roll the same size die, add your constitution modifier to it, and add that new number to your previous one, and that'll be your new health. So for example, Again, taking this monk at level one, I've got nine health because I have a D8 for my hit die plus one constitution. So if I were to take the average, that would be uh, four health plus one is five. So my new average health would be five plus nine, 14. Or if the DM says, hey, we're going to roll, I can then roll the D8 and say I roll a seven. That's super lucky. Seven plus one. For my constitution modifier is 8, 8 plus 9 is 17, that's now my level 2 health, and it continues on from there. Now what can be a little confusing is let's say our monk goes on a few adventures and is now level 4. So you can see now I have 4d8 for hit dice. That does not mean you roll 4d8 to get your new health. You're still only rolling one of those dice every level. What it says by 4d8 is that you now have a pool of uh, 4d8s that you can spend during a short rest to heal up, it, heal yourself up. Um, but the way this works now 
is um, we'll, we'll assume that I was rolling for my health. So this rolled HP value is just a running total of the raw number on the dice you've rolled. So again, looking at 4d8, we'll say my first dice was level 1, so it's guaranteed 8. So let's say for level 2, I rolled the dice, I got a 4. So I add 4 more to that, bumps up to a 12. Then let's say for level 3, I got really lucky and rolled the 8. So that now bumps it up to 20 for 3rd level. And then let's say for 4th level, I got unlucky and only rolled a 2. So that's just a running tally of how much health I have. And then you see here it says the hit point bonus plus 4 from Constitution. That is 1 point for every level I've gotten so far. So that's why even though my roll is 22, I have a maximum now of 26. It's because of that uh, level change. Um, and there's a little more advanced feature called multi-classing, which lets you take uh, extra levels in different classes. And if you multi-class into a class that has a different size hit die, you add that uh, and use that for your new health as long as you're leveling up in that class. So, for example, say I got, you know, the next level for fifth level, I want to take a level into fighter. They have a D10 for a hit die. So instead of a D8, for this next level, I would actually roll a D10, and then I'd also have that one D10 to spend during a short rest to try to heal myself. But if I took another level into monk, I'd get an additional D8 because the hit dice is tied to the level of the class, not your overall character level. So something to remember for the future, if you want to, you know, uh, ever attempt multi-classing, uh, the hit dice are specific to the level in the class, not your overall character level. Um, training event three, uh, Sam, we got uh, Gauth in the in Discord chat. Does train event three have a date and time? Mm-hmm. Yep, I saw that one there. Um, training event three, uh, that's uh, it's kind of a separate thing, but it's on uh, Meetup. It um, That is just a general sign-up event that has information about uh, the training program in it. Inside of there, there is a, a link to a spreadsheet, and the spreadsheet has the individual dates and times that you can sign up for. Um, if you check the comments and stuff too, there's a little bit of, there's like a screenshot shared in there showing kind of how it works and stuff like that. Um, so those are just like open. I just post those periodically to like let people know about the, that information. Um, but ultimately, you go to the spreadsheet to sign up. Uh, new events or new dates will also be added soon here for March once I get all those posted. Uh, I guess one last thing I would like to cover uh, for character advancement, um, since I went ahead and leveled my character up a little bit, is every four class levels... So every time you hit level four in a particular class, um, you'll get what's called an Ability Score Improvement, or ASI. This lets you increase one score by two, two scores by one, or if your DM is playing with it, allows you to take a feat. So this is where if you're making a higher level character, you can kind of plan out how you would like uh, that to go. So again, taking this, I know for a fact um, that if I were to go back and look at my character sheet, Okay, so you can see I've got two odds currently, right? I've got Wisdom 15 and Charisma 13. So if I wanted to, I could go back. And for my ability score improvements, I could take one in Wisdom, one in Charisma. And then once I get saved... You'll see they've both bumped up to the next even number and increased the bonus. So that's a very a very good way to kind of think about as your character is leveling up. Think about if any of your stats could use improvement, or if you want to customize your character further, you can take an optional feat as well. Um, yeah, that uh, does it for me, everyone. I appreciate you all for coming, giving me your time and your attention. And uh, as I mentioned, if you have any other questions, comments, concerns, Feel free to message me or anyone else uh, with one of the more experienced roles in the Discord. We are all more than happy to help and provide our assistance as best we can. Cool. All right. Thanks, Ducks. Appreciate your time. Thanks for doing this and putting this on. It's super helpful.
Of course. Always a pleasure. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And, uh, yeah, just keep an eye out on the upcoming events channel and uh, meetups for uh, more special events, more games, and all that pretty good stuff.